All right, let's get started. It's loud. So our last, last class today. Um, so next week, Tuesday, we'll have the final exam. And the exam starts at 10.30, 10.30, right? So not 11 o'clock, not the usual class start time, it's 10.30, but it is in this room. Um, also, um, I'll probably ditch the, um, the short answer questions this time, because it's... <laughs> mm, uh, um, for the only reason that the, uh, uh, the grader, uh, it, it takes them a long time to grade this stuff and it will be just nice to turn this around and give you a grade back quickly. Um, so it will be just multiple choice, uh, same, same deal as before. And, and just as a reminder, uh, it is, the, the exam is not cumulative, right? So it's only that last, the last couple of lectures that we, that, we, that we went through, all the stuff after the second midterm. So is there any question about the upcoming exam. Okay, so today uh, we'll finish the, uh, the chapter about development talking about uh, moral reasoning. So we'll discuss um, Kohlberg's theory of moral development where he talks about a series of stages uh, that people go through um, and he argued that people have to go through these sequences exactly, and that the higher stages are sort of more sophisticated, better in a way than the lower stages. So it's a hierarchical uh, theory of, of moral development, moral reasoning. Uh, this has led to some criticisms um, that what Kohlberg has proposed is interesting, but maybe it's not quite right. Um, and especially, uh, we know from recent research in cognitive neuroscience that we, we should think about the role of emotion in emotional processes uh, when people engage in moral reasoning. Uh, it's just not just a matter of thinking abstractly and thinking sort of a, a very principled, sophisticated fashion. There's sort of gut feelings also involved when you engage in moral reasoning. And then we'll finish with a um, somewhat controversial topic on baby morality. Uh, the question is, are we, um, do we have to learn from our parents, from our environment, what's right and what's wrong? Um, and in that case, babies are just blank slates. Uh, we just have to teach them about morality. Or do babies come with some innate sense of right and wrong? And that innateness theory might seem implausible. Uh, after all, what do babies know? Um, but there's some really, really cool experiments that, that uh, challenge um, maybe your, your notions of, of what babies can do and cannot do. So we have to distinguish here between two different questions. Um, so on the one hand, when we talk about moral dilemmas and moral reasoning, there's the prescriptive question, um, like what is the right answer? Uh, we'll talk about some dilemmas. And philosophers, they might be very interested in, in arguing about, you know, the answer should be this versus that. Uh, but that's clearly in the domain of philosophy and ethics. Um, and so this is clearly a class about psychology. So we're interested here in the descriptive question. What is happening when people engage in moral reasoning? Uh, so the answer itself, whether it's right or wrong, that's less relevant. It's more relevant um, what processes uh, occur when people think about various uh, moral dilemmas. And um, early on in history, people thought uh, that moral reasoning is just a matter of uh, applying sort of formal reasoning. Um, but nowadays, based on this sort of cognitive science, cognitive, re uh, cognitive neuroscience research, we know that uh, there's, there's all kinds of emotional gut feelings uh, that strongly influence our moral reasoning. So uh, one question is, how do we go from being adorable little children? Uh, I told a videographer that uh, I wouldn't use swear words because she has to edit them out or, um, to, to moral adults. Um, 
So what is that development, developmental uh, process? So one researcher, a very influential researcher, uh, is Lawrence Kohlberg. And he um, was inspired by the research by Piaget. Uh, so he read Piaget's research on cognitive development. And he thought, well, maybe there's a similar developmental process for moral reasoning. Uh, that there's this sequence of stages that, that children and adolescents and adults go through. So he, he posed these various moral dilemmas uh, to uh, children. And, um, and then he asked them, OK, so this is your, your answer. Uh, but he asked them to, to back up the answer. Like, why do you think this is, uh, why do you give this answer? So he wasn't interested in the particular decisions that people reached. He was interested in the reasoning process. And so here's this famous uh, Kohlberg uh, uh, dilemma. So I'll read it to you. So in Europe, a woman was near death from cancer. One drug might save her, a form of radium that a pharmacist in the same town had recently discovered. The pharmacist was charging $2,000, 10 times what it cost him to make. The sick woman's husband, um, Heinz, he went to everyone he knew to borrow the money, but he could only get together about half what it cost. He told the pharmacist that his wife was dying, and he asked him to sell cheaper and let him pay, let him pay him later. But the pharmacist said no. The husband got desperate and broke into the man's store to steal the drug for his wife. And then the question is, does that, is that right? Should the husband have done that? Yes or no? So, and then the important question, uh, why? Why do you think um, he should or should not have done that? So Kohlberg came up with a classification system um, that distinguished between sort of three different ways of reasoning uh, in these dilemmas. And so he distinguished between pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional moral reasoning. So first, at the pre-conventional level of reasoning, this is all about um, reasoning from an individual's perspective. Uh, it's all about me. Uh, or I'm reasoning about the person affected, uh, like the husband in, in, this, in this case. And if, if there is a reward, uh, if, if some action can lead to reward, it's probably a good action. If some action leads to punishment, it's a bad action. So every thought, everything is, is thought of in terms of reward versus punishment. The rules <clears throat> that govern reward versus loss, they feel is imposed from the outside. Um, so the reasoning is that you have no control over the rules. They're just given uh, by society. So Kohlberg found that most children under nine reason uh, in this way, some teenagers and most adult criminals. Um, so here are some examples of the type of reasoning you might find from uh, at this level. So if he lets his wife die, he'll get in trouble, focusing on punishment. It won't bother him much to serve a little jail time if he still has his wife to when he gets out, focusing on reward. He shouldn't steal it, he'll be caught and sent to jail. Again, focusing on uh, punishment. Now at the next level, uh, Kohlberg argued that here, um, you can uh, extend your reasoning uh, to a slightly larger perspective. But here, you're focusing on the impact of your actions on your immediate sort of social environment. Uh, let's say that could be your significant other. It could be the social group that you belong to or identify with. And perhaps you might also think about society in general. And so a good action is something that has a positive outcome for the group. Uh, it leads to sort of a harmonious outcome and doesn't harm relationships uh, within the group. And Kohlberg found that most teens and adults reason at that level. So here are some example uh, statements that belong at the stage, like Heinz should steal the drug. You can't blame him for doing something out of, the, out of love for his wife. You blame him if he didn't love his wife enough to save her. Right? So focusing on the outcome of this personal relationship, 
uh, that what's important is to maintain this uh, harmony between people. Or it's always wrong to steal. What if everyone stole? Then there would be no law. Uh, focusing in a slightly different, different level, uh, more at the level of society. Now finally, at the last level, the level that Kohlberg argued, or he found through experimental research, that very few adults can be classified at this level. Here you, um, you are aware of laws, but you are also aware of principles that might transcend the laws. Uh, so sometimes laws are in accord with uh, sort of general ethical principles, principles of fairness, um, equality, um, but sometimes they may be in conflict. Um, and then your actions are uh, guided by sort of this, this consideration of these ethical principles. What, what should society be like if we follow all these ethical principles? Uh, what could it be like? So here's this elaborate type of reasoning that somebody um, might use in this case. It's wrong to violate another person's right, rights, in this case, to property. But the fact that her life's in danger transcends every other standard you could use to judge his action. Life is more important than property. Usually moral and legal standpoints coincide. Here they conflict. Okay, so it goes beyond just the consideration of laws, uh, the current laws. Uh, this goes to more like universal uh, ethical principles. Now, as I said, uh, Kohlberg was inspired by Piaget, and there's a nice direct correspondence between the uh, stages that Kohlberg proposed and Piaget's stages. For example, um, Piaget's pre-operational stage, if you remember, that was a stage where the child um, uh, mostly reasons about him or herself. So it was very egocentric, right? So what I think is what, how everybody else uh, thinks. And in Kohlberg's stage, uh, the pre-conventional stage, similarly, um, the consideration is about the individual. Like, what consequences does this have for me? In concrete operations, uh, Piaget proposed that here the child can think about, um, uh, think from the viewpoint of, of other people, but the, um, the thinking is very concrete uh, and lacks sort of sophistication, if you will. And similarly, Kohlberg's to the conventional stage, um, uh, people's reasoning just only extends to the immediate uh, social group. And then finally, in Piaget's formal operation stage, finally, the, there are some uh, sort of abstract reasoning that's possible, similarity to uh, the post-conventional Kohlberg stage where uh, more universal principles are considered. So the key idea here of, of Kohlberg's theory about his hierarchy of moral reasoning, that it just focused on reasoning. Um, that is, there's nothing else uh, to consider when we think about sort of moral decisions. Uh, it's just a way of sort of logically reasoning about a situation. And he argues that as the child's reasoning becomes more and more abstract, they become less and less self-centered and think about sort of more uh, the universal uh, principles. Now, Kohlberg's theory was uh, very influential. Um, but it's been criticized for uh, a number of reasons. One is that the viewpoint of uh, the post-conventional reasoning, that that's the highest form of reasoning, that that's in, in some sense the best way of reasoning, the pinnacle, if you will, of, of moral reasoning, that's, that is a very Western perspective. So when researchers pose these dilemmas, like Heinz's uh, drug dilemma, to various other cultures, um, they found that a lot of cultures, um, people refused to go with um, reasoning about sort of univer or these very abstract uh, ethical principles. Tibetan monks, for example, um, they're somewhat confused about these moral dilemmas. Tibetan monks, they, 
They immediately ask questions like, what is the personal relationship between Heinz and his wife? And if he does this, what consequences does, does his actions have for the pharmacist? And how do people feel about the pharmacist? Um, very much focused on personal relationships. And that lands Tibetan monks squarely in the conventional uh, stage. But it's not quite clear if that's necessarily uh, less good uh, than this sort of very Western uh, perspective of post-conventional reasoning. There might also be some gender bias uh, in these studies. Uh, so the book mentions that uh, overall, um, that women score basically the same as men. But there are some studies that suggest that women um, consider uh, personal relationships much more than men. And that would lead them more into this post-conventional stage, or this, in this, sorry, in this conventional stage and the post-conventional stage. So uh, Carol Gilligan has done a lot of research trying to understand sort of the differences between, uh, uh, between individuals and between men and women in how uh, they engage in moral reasoning. And she um, argued that there are sort of two ways to look at moral dilemmas. Uh, one might focus on the justice aspects of a problem, like is something fair? Is it, you know, what is the equality on the law, uh, considerations of right to liberty, property, life, etc. On the other hand, you could also focus on uh, sort of a caring dimension. Um, how will this decision affect others in the social group? Would it promote harmony or dissension? So she gave um, uh, adolescents uh, various uh, problems, similar to uh, Kohlberg's problems. And she asked people to, again, sort of explain their reasoning. And then she uh, classified people's uh, reasoning into justice versus caring, but it's not either or. So your reason could include some caring components. It could also include some justice uh, components. So here's an example of one of these uh, problems that she posed to subjects. Uh, the porcupine and the moles. It was growing cold and a porcupine was looking for a home. He found a lovely cave, but it was occupied by a family of moles. Would you mind if I share your home for the winter? The porcupine asked the moles. And the generous moles consented, but the cave was small and every time the moles moved around, they were scratched by the porcupine's sharp quills. And at last the moles gathered courage to approach their visitor. Please leave, they said, and let us have our cave to ourselves again. Oh no, said the porcupine, this place suits me very well. How would you solve this problem? And why is your solution a good one? So she found, um, and actually some colleagues of her found, uh, that um, some people uh, focus on these justice uh, dimension uh, so they come up with reasons like, the porcupine has to go, definitely. It's the mole's house, right? Or it's their ownership, and nobody else has a right to it. Um, so focusing more on these abstract uh, ideas. Or there could be a caring dimension to the reasoning, like wrap the porcupine in a towel so he can stay, but he won't prick the moles. The both of them should try to get together to make the hole bigger. Or there would be times when the moles would leave or the porcupine would stand still or they take turns doing stuff, eating stuff and not moving. Um, so trying to solve the problem, uh, let everybody get along uh, together. So the results of this study showed that men focus more, but not exclusively, on this justice dimension, uh, right? These more general uh, principles, but occasionally, um, insert statements uh, related to caring or solving sort of a, this interpersonal, uh, this problem in an interpersonal uh, approach. Whereas females, um, they approach this problem much more from a caring perspective. And so Gilligan proposed that uh, maybe women are just socialized more to be uh, caretakers. And so they focus more naturally on a sort of caring perspective. But this is not exclusively male versus female. Uh, and you, you can see that uh, 
both men and women, they can emphasize both the justice and caring components. So Gilligan argues that um, Kohlberg's stages should not be interpreted as a hierarchy, where the top level is necessarily the best level or the most sophisticated level. She would like to argue that the conventional level and the post-conventional level, those are basically all equal. Um, none is better than the other. And it's just a different uh, perspective uh, that you bring to the situation. Now, another problem with Kohlberg's approach might be that your reasoning ability, how sophisticated you are in your explanations, might have nothing to do with your actual actions, might have nothing to do with your moral behavior. So you might remember Bernie Madoff, who uh, made a lot of money uh, on some Ponzi schemes. <coughs> By all accounts, he was very clever, very sophisticated. He would probably easily pass uh, Kohlberg's test, right, and talk about general principles. Uh, but he's not behaving morally. <coughs> Similarly, you might, engage, you might encounter a person who's not very sophisticated at all, might reason in a very sort of simple way, but might behave very morally. Um, so can we really say that how you, your level of sophistication, that that corresponds to moral behavior? And here's the big problem. Um, so recently, uh, there's a lot of research uh, from psychologists and neuroscientists that calls into question this link between uh, sort of moral behavior and, and moral decisions. If you ask people for some of these dilemmas, like why did you decide this? Sometimes you can stump people and you can't really explain why you think this should be the outcome or that should be the outcome. You're just a little stumped and you have this gut feeling that something is right or wrong, but you can't point your finger to it. And it turns out that emotions, they play a very important role in your moral judgments. Um, Sometimes it's a gut feeling that you have, and maybe it's that gut feeling that drives your decision making. Um, and then later on, you might just rationalize um, your decision. Like, oh, I think it's this, this is the right uh, outcome because of so and so, but it really, it was a, the, gut, the gut feeling uh, that, um, that's sort of the causal explanation. So there's some interesting examples that show this gap between the, the kinds of reasoning that you might apply and the kinds of things that feel right. And I want to go into one famous example, and this is called the, um, the, tro the trolley problem. And there are two, uh, two versions that we'll consider of the trolley problem. The first version is the switch dilemma. So here's the scenario. You, that you, you are this person, this person standing at the switch, okay? And there's this trolley that you see that's running out of control on the tracks towards people. And you see that the, the, the operator of the trolley is slumped over the controls, incapacitated, and this trolley will go. And it will go um, definitely kill those five people that are inexplicably bound to the train tracks. You might ask, why are they bound to the train tracks? Why are they? Don't ask, it's a philosopher's problem, right? <laughs> you just go with it. Um, so you are standing at the switch, and if you throw the switch, then the trolley will go on an alternate track, where again, for an explicable reason, there's somebody bound to the track, and now this person will be killed if you throw the switch. So the moral dilemma is, would you throw the switch? Yes or no, right? If you throw the switch, one person dies. If you don't throw the switch, five people die. Well, let's ask for some classroom participation. What, what would you say? Would you throw the switch? Does somebody say, say they should not throw the switch, which is an interesting answer? Can anybody say, motivate why you should not throw the switch, perhaps? Yes? Can you speak up a little? 
Let's say that these are people that you don't know. <laughs> They're all equal, right? Five versus one. So what would be a standard answer to give? You throw the switch because, because of what reason? You save more people, right? And that's a sort of cold calculation that might be behind your decision, right? And that's a called a utilitarian perspective, right? You just do counts. Uh, I can save this many versus this many. Let's go with the, few, the most number of lives saved, which is great. And that's what a lot of philosophers, the vast majority of philosophers say that that is the right decision. There's a few puzzling explanations where somebody says, you shouldn't throw the switch because if you throw the switch, you are engaged in somebody's death. Um, Right, it's difficult to understand the reasoning exactly, but that's a minority opinion. Yes? Is the immediate response to some of the switch based on numbers a heuristic of some sort? Just a kind of immediate shortcut to just say, hey. Yeah, it could be a shortcut, but it could also, you, people could think about it for a while, right? Yeah. And so pe people that typically take some time and then realize, throw the switch, right? OK, so this is what we just talked about. So what justifies your judgment? Most people say, save as many as you can. The good of the many outweighs the good of the few. And this is all can be described as the utilitarian perspective. Now, that's great. But now let's consider a version, uh, an alternate version. <laughs> so again, there's this trolley. This out of control trolley will definitely kill those five people, right? Because it's just barreling down the tracks. And only a heavy object <laughs> can stop this trolley. And a heavy object will definitely stop the trolley. And as it happens, there's a large man standing next to you on this bridge. Should you throw the man off the bridge? So who would say no? And why would you say no? Can somebody say why would you why would you say no? <laughs> In the back, yeah? Well, um, first of all, the, the bigger man is stronger than the little man, so I don't think it's going to work out. It's <laughs> a good point. Again, it's a, it's a philosopher's problem. I, you just assume that that's possible. That's not an issue. Right? You know it's possible, and this will definitely solve the problem. Right? So would you, th would you throw him off the bridge? You would? <laughs> I'm glad you were able to admit that. Yeah, so throwing him off the bridge is directly like contributing to his death, whereas if you flip the switch, that doesn't feel like you're like actually like physically causing his death. But why is that different? Right? In the end, if right, the utilitarian perspective. It's the same number of people that would die versus be saved, right? Why, why is that different? That you cause somebody's death directly, intentionally, versus the other one, it's your less, a little bit less, but you still throw the switch. It's still, you're causing that one person to die in the other dilemma, right? Um, is the other scenario, since the guy is tied up, he kind of has the idea that he's probably going to die. Like, it does come, come across his mind. Whereas here, like, it was just like totally catch him off guard. OK. Maybe I'm contributing to one. That could be. That could be uh, a factor. Yeah. Any other? The situation is he's more actively engaging the situation. OK. He has to personally, physically do the action. Yes.
Right. So th I think that explains why you would take the action or not take the action. But is that sort of, is, is that sort of the right moral perspective, I guess? Uh, that, that's sort of the, the difficult thing to explain. Why is one, one decision good versus bad? Um, well, it's, it's fun to, to, to think about this. Uh, there's other variants you can find. Um, there's one variant where, as it turns out, this large man that's standing there, he was the villain. He was the one that tied up all these five people. <laughs> so now, now the perspective changes a little bit, and now many people would be far, very happy to throw him off the bridge. <laughs> yeah. So this, these are fun, fun problems. So the outcome is that most people would say yes to the switch question and no to the footbridge question. And by and large, you find similar decisions across cultures, people with different backgrounds. Um, there's some difference between men and women. Uh, men take the sort of more cold perspective of the utilitarian perspective. Women, uh, they're, they're a little bit, um, uh, stay away from that kind of reasoning a bit more. Uh, but these, these, these patterns seem to be quite universal. Now, the explanation is a little difficult. Uh, so philosophers, they have written many books about these problems, and they can't quite put a finger on it or clearly explain why it's morally acceptable to sacrifice one life for five in one case, but not in the other case. What is that unifying set of principles uh, that, it, that would explain that? Well, that would be a problem for philosophers, but here we're interested in psychology, like what is going on when people make these uh, decisions. And one explanation might be that uh, emotional responses play a big role. So the trolley dilemma, the first one, uh, the switch dilemma, that seems more impersonal, right? You're a little bit further removed from the people that are affected, right? Throwing a switch doesn't seem that either you're causing all that much. Um, Whereas the footbridge dilemma, uh, here you are personally involved, right? You are actively intervening and you are pushing somebody uh, off the bridge and you're actively deciding to kill somebody. And that makes it more personal and more emotional. So when you look at uh, brain activation, when people are reasoning about these uh, problems, you find that the impersonal moral dilemma uh, activates memory areas, decision-making areas, and these more personal moral dilemmas, they activate brain areas associated with emotion. So specifically, uh, the finding is that the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, uh, the activity there determines your response. So we talked about the prefrontal cortex, um, that that is related to working memory, it's also related to uh, uh, sort of regulating your decision-making processes. And this area, a little bit more to the back, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, it regulates um, um, your, your emotional responses. Uh, so it decides sort of what, what is the emotional response as we consider the consequences of our actions. Now, some people that have damage to these areas they will respond very differently in these dilemmas. People with damage here, they were perfectly happy to push the man off the bridge and take this cold sort of perspective of, you know, saving five lives versus just, you know, uh, killing one person. These people would also be happy to throw a sick man off a boat, a lifeboat, if that saves the other people in the boat. Whereas most people uh, don't want to go there. Um, and this raises um, fundamental questions about cause and effect. Um, so do you first have this gut feeling of right and wrong, and then you rationalize it, like, oh, this is wrong because of so-and-so? Or do you first reason about something and then feel the consequence of your, of your action? And it's not quite clear what is cause and effect here. Uh, it does seem that... Um, 
your gut response is definitely associated with your reasoning and that explains in part uh, what your decision will be. Now this brings us to, uh, to this, this tricky uh, topic, the final topic. Are we born with a sense of morality? Where does a sense of morality come from? Are we born as a blank slate and we, we have to be taught everything about right and wrong? Or uh, do we have some innate sense of right and wrong? Now, we've read about Chomsky, uh, that Chomsky believed uh, that you can only learn the complex parts of language, like, uh, like syntax, because we're born with a universal grammar that tells us sort of uh, how we can learn a language. It doesn't tell us what language we specifically learn. And other psychologists have argued that, well, we might be also born with some universal moral grammars, if you will, uh, with a, some foundation that's, that's innate that allows us to understand what's uh, right and what's wrong. Now, this seems a little far-fetched. Like, how can you be born with that stuff? Uh, how is that even possible? But there's some really interesting findings here. Uh, One-day-old infants, they cry when they hear another infant cry a one-day-old infant. And it's not because the noise is loud, because if, there's an, uh, if there are other noises that are similarly loud, they don't cry as much. So there seems to be something about an infant responding to another infant. Toddlers, they try to comfort people in distress um, and try to come uh, to the rescue. And so, uh, recently, there's a lot of fascinating research with uh, very young children. We're talking about three-month-old babies to five-month-old babies. And clearly, they can't talk, right? You can't pose this footbridge dilemma to them. Um, but you can have, like, puppet plays in front of them, where some puppets are good puppets, some pu puppets are bad, and then you ask them, like, what puppets do you like? Not, not a verbal question, but what puppets would you like to touch? That's essentially the experimental setup. So there are two scenarios here. The first scenario um, is, is pretty simple, and I want you to think very deeply about whether you believe the conclusion that babies know right, right from wrong, or whether there are potential confounds that we should worry about. Okay. And Wynn is part of a new wave of researchers who have discovered seemingly simple ways to probe what's really going on in those adorable little heads. Up close the curtain. We watched as Wynn and her team asked a question that 20 years ago might have gotten a laugh out of her field. Does Wesley here, at the ripe old age of five months, know the difference between right and wrong? Wesley watches as the puppet in the center struggles to open up a box with a toy inside. The puppy in the yellow shirt comes over and lends a hand. Then the scene repeats itself, but this time the puppy in the blue shirt comes and slams the box shut. Nice behavior? Mean behavior. At least to our eyes. But is that how a five-month-old sees it? And does he have a preference? So you do you know the guys from the show? To find out, a researcher who doesn't know which puppet is nice and which is mean offers Wesley a choice. Who do you like? He can't answer, but he can reach. That one. Wesley chose the good guy, and he wasn't alone. That one. More than three quarters of the babies tested reached for the nice puppet. That one. All right. <coughs> oh, so they they do say um, that the the person who's handing out the the puppets that that person does not know uh, which one was the good versus the bad one that that was controlled for. So it could be that you know this person that that's handing out the dolls, there could be some asymmetry, well, one doll being closer. But they say, and we, we just have to take them for their word, that that person that's handing out the dolls does not know the manipulation or which doll was assigned to what condition. So hopefully that's not a confound. That's clearly what you have to worry about, right? Uh, like, uh, 
pick this one, right? Uh, but there's another potential confound. There's something, uh, is it really about right versus wrong, or is there some, some other problem maybe with this study? Do you have a hand up? No? Yes? I don't know, maybe like the color of the shirts, like the baby just like the baby. Maybe, yeah, that could be subtle, if, but hopefully they control that, right? That, that color is sort of counterbalanced across conditions. Again, hopefully that those things, I don't know by heart if that's controlled for. Um, so one, one potential issue is that the, uh, the doll or the, the puppet that slams the box shut, that might be just a more scary puppet, right? So I don't want to pick the scary puppet, right? The puppet that, that, that moves a lot. So that's one confound. But amazingly, they did a follow-up experiment. That's the next one where they controlled for this, this effect. And this, this makes me, I still don't believe it, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm getting there, maybe. <laughs> on this experiment, they show babies like James and a puppet behaving badly. Instead of rolling the ball back to the puppet in the middle, this green shirt bunny keeps the other puppet's ball and runs away. Then James is shown a second shot. This time, the bunny, who we just saw steal the ball, tries to open up the box to get the toy. Will James still prefer the puppet who helps out, or will he now prefer the one who slams the box shut? Who do you like? He chose the one who slammed it shut, as did 81% of babies tested. The study's conclusion, babies seem to view the ball thief as deserving so do you think that babies, therefore, are born with an innate sense of justice and they are the I think so. Yeah, so there's a very interesting episode behind it. Um, so I don't think we, we have any sort of proof yet uh, that these things are innate. Um, so the research is, is still ongoing. So to finish up here, um, so we talked about Kohlberg and the gradual development of uh, abstract reasoning. And then we learned that um, emotion plays a big role, uh, that there's no such thing as emotionless rationality, and that there's a broad range of emotions that can guide moral decisions. Empathy, love, disgust, anger, guilt, shame, fear. And it's not quite clear what's cause and effect. Are these feelings sort of explaining or causing your explanations, or are these explanations causing your feelings? Um, and so, yeah, again, we need to do more research. So this is the end of the class. I have enjoyed teaching this, this class to you. Thanks for your attention. I'll see you guys at the exam, and I hope to see you uh, on campus. So thank you.